Uh, and with that, uh, let's bring up our first speaker, Angel Rivera. It's okay. Angel, what are you going to tell us about today? I'm going to talk about shiny, uh, avoiding, how to avoid shiny objects. Ah, uh, shiny objects. So, like, somebody comes up to me and is like, oh, Kubernetes is the next not hot new thing. Where's Chris at? <laughs> sort, of, sort, of. sort of, right? And everyone's like, oh, I got to go use this new framework or I got to go use this new tool. Here we go. Okay, forget it. I'm just going to. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for. Uh, oh, cool. Let's, uh, w which way do I click? <laughs> Is it the this? direction you want the slides to Ah, okay, they're worn out, sorry. <laughs> All right, cool. So um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for um, attending this talk. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about shiny object syndrome uh, and what that means, or to frame that in, in, for this talk, is basically it's the situations where we're on technology teams or, you know, as individuals, we want a solution to solve all of our problems, right, and we believe that that exists. So um, before I get into that, I'll talk about myself a little bit, right? Uh, my name is Angel Rivera. I started my career off in the United States Air Force, working in the United States Air Force Space Command, not Space Force, right? But if that comes to fruition, I will re-enlist. <laughs> I'm super excited about that. Uh, so uh, yeah, I was in the Air Force, and there I started my programming career. Um, as a professional. I had lots of mentors around me. I was working at Space Canaver uh, Space Canaveral, yes, uh, Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And I had a lot of mentors and a wealth of uh, people supporting me uh, through my career. Um, and then after that, I left. Uh, I didn't re-enlist. I joined uh, a couple of startups, worked in private industry. Uh, then I did uh, a long time. <laughs> I, I worked in, uh, as a civilian uh, within the federal government. And I learned a lot of things, right? I learned how to work, uh, how things worked inside of big organizations and um, how bureaucracies work. And I learned a lot about shiny objects within <laughs> the federal government as well. So I like that. That wasn't a joke, but thanks. <laughs> it's awesome. Cool. So um, as a young developer, right, um, and some people have touched on that in previous talks, as a, as a young developer, I always cared about and wondered about where my code went after I wrote it, right? I spent a lot of time working on this stuff, and then I packaged it, and I usually put it on a, a floppy or a, or, a, or a CD, and I gave it to a manager, or I had to put it on a network share somewhere, and some strange person was like taking my code and putting it right for the, uh, somewhere for the public to use. Um, and I was always, like I said, super curious about how that all worked. So I would walk down the halls to the operation shops, and as operations people are usually very protective and suspicious, right, of your motives. I'd ask around, like, hey, so why, what are you doing with my software? And, because you only heard from them if stuff was broken, and they were pointing the finger at you, right? So um, after a while, I was persistent, and they, it, you know, I kind of broke them down. Being from Jersey and all, it was pretty easy uh, to do, <laughs> manipulating them to like you a little bit. Uh, and they actually realized that I cared, right, about what was going on. And they actually appreciated it. And once they did that, they actually started training me in the dark arts of ops, right? So throughout my career after that, I inevitably ended up, I always got hired as a software developer engineer, and then I ended up always working in operational shops, right? So now I want to tell you a story about uh, my experience on a team and our shiny object moment. So the team I was working on was filled with some really, really talented people, very skilled in operations and development. And we actually worked really well. The DevOps culture was really, really strong with this team. I always like, went around and said, you know, we're the A team in, in, in the organization. And actually, we were. And it was, it was pretty cool. So as developers do, we get requirements, and we had to build out this new web UI feature right, for the platform. Uh, the requirements were driven by our customers, so we were super excited to get uh, working on this, designing it, and, and getting it out to our customers. One of the problems that we encountered, though, was we had a 2D flat relational data model, right? Kind of old, 
And these new requirements required a hierarchical data model, which for those of you that don't know, it's like 2D and 3D, right? Uh, hierarchical data models are more robust. They have like deeply nested nodes, all that good stuff. It just wasn't meshing. So our team, you know, we came up trying to solve these problems uh, with wedging a relational model into this new hierarchical model. It was just not working at all. We were trying to use the existing systems and, and methodologies to, to produce, you know, the solution for, for these requirements. Uh, we were deeply frustrated. It just wasn't working. We were, everything we came up with using the, the relational model was just not performant. And it felt actually uh, very hacky. We just kind of hacked the things together. So I've been working with MongoDB on the side in my own private kind of uh, learning. Uh, and I pitched it to the team. I said, look, this is MongoDB. This is what it's built for. It's, it's built to handle these hierarchical data structures and, and stores them in the same manner. So there's no processing in between. So the team fell in love with it. I, I had wrote a few functions that we were building out for the, uh, the, the new features. They, they just loved it, right? It solved our problem right away. It, it eliminated all the, all the man hours that we, had put, we were going to put into this. So we had a great relationship with our ops teams. They were all on board with you know, uh, putting up this new MongoDB infrastructure. Uh, and as usual, you know, we, like I said, we worked well together. They were, they were so down to, to get us where we needed to be. The problem was I was the only one with very limited MongoDB experience, right? Uh, again, I was a software developer uh, and not really quite a DBA as such. So uh, they were looking to me to lead the team to <laughs> build out this infrastructure, which is fine. I mean, we've done this before. Uh, we got to work. Uh, we built out. The uh, development, the quality uh, environments, and then the production environments, A and B, right? Uh, environments for that. And then the team also, oops, the team also built out a stable release, right? We, we, get, we, we really knocked that, that project out really, really quickly. Uh, and it was all due to the fact that we could fix that problem we were having with our data structures. Uh, so we were all happy, right? We met our project goals. Uh, we met our, our deadlines. Uh, we were actually patting ourselves on our back and really super excited. Management was happy. Our customers were happy. As soon as we deployed this thing, they were using it. And it was, it was awesome to see the activity right, with this new platform or the new features. Uh, life was good, right? Uh, we set up monitoring. Uh, the application was performing really, really well. Our users were, like again, really happy, complimenting us on the work we'd done. And yeah, it was, life was good. Bum, 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 right? Fast forward 90 days later, alerts start popping off out of the MongoDB clusters, uh, CPUs at 100% pegged all the time. Uh, we're getting high IO, disk thrashing, right? Performance uh, reports started coming in from the customers, hey, the, time, the app's timing out, right? And then, then the failures ensued. So as good ops teams do, we jumped into troubleshooting mode started peeling back the onion. And again, remember, we didn't have that much experience with MongoDB, because we just didn't go back and try to backfill some of that knowledge that we needed. So again, we were a great team, a lot of professionals on board. We were quick to find out what was happening and, and, and with the system and what was causing these failures. <clears throat> Customers loved this <laughs> product so much, they generated over 15 million records. Now, I know databases are supposed to handle this stuff, and MongoDB is supposed to eat this stuff up. Uh, but the volume of the records was actually the problem for us. And the reason why is we had poorly written queries. Right? Uh, we indexed on the wrong keys. We didn't even know what we were going to index on. And that caused uh, uh, a lot of issues. Uh, we took a relational schema and tried to implement that right, into a non-relational platform. Don't do that. Non-relational means non-relational. We literally hacked together link tables in a non-relational system. And the schema was all off. And that came from just being inexperienced. So we figured out that the volume right, of the records that we had in, in the current the collection or table was the problem. So in order to you know, recover the system, we did some math and we said, all right, well, we'll take half of the oldest records, move them into a new collection that's not being queried, and guess what? The system started working again. And it bought us enough time to 
go ahead and you know, put a fix in, uh, get the fix, uh, test it, then put it into production and solved all of our problems. We recovered the system, everything was working, everyone was happy. But the damage had been done. We had bad, you know, customers had bad experience. Organization, right, lost time and money, so did our customers. And our team's street cred was just like gone, right? We were just, this, hit, this hurt us the most. Uh, our credibility went down amongst ourselves, amongst uh, our customers, and management. So as all good teams do, we performed a hot wash or a post-mortem. Obviously, right, we had a technology problem, right? Bad programming, queries, indexing, all that good stuff. But at the root of it, we, you know, when you do these, when we did these kind of things, post-mortems, we, went, we wanted to know the core reasons. And one of the reasons was we were so good that we didn't do any of the processes and procedures listed in our uh, standard operating procedures, right? We were so arrogant that we were like, yeah, this worked. Let's just throw it in. What's going to happen? What's... And it worked. It did work until we started accumulating data, right? So, uh, yeah, we found out that, yeah, we, we neglected our own right, procedures, and, and that was not a good thing. We didn't properly vet MongoDB. We didn't really understand its capabilities or limitations. We didn't understand non-relational, relational, uh, the difference between the two schemas and how that really worked, right? So MongoDB had become our shiny object, uh, but it wasn't MongoDB's fault. It was, it was our fault. It was our team's fault. And now I want to share <laughs> some of my thoughts on how you all can avoid this shiny object syndrome. So right, don't believe your hype, right? <laughs> When teams are really operating efficiently and they're awesome, that's when I start worrying, right, and, and, and start thinking about, okay, now where are we way too confident in, and, and there's something, something's wrong, right? There, there, there's, you have to start pinpointing things, and usually it's we cut corners, like we did, like the example I gave you with our team. Obviously, thoroughly vet your new tech. Understand the limitations, capabilities of the technology you're implementing. Uh, and actually, the concepts around that, that's where I've seen in my career a lot of gotchas, right? Don't break protocol. You have SOPs for a reason, and processes follow them. They're a great guideline for, for new folks and for people who don't understand what you do. Uh, also, uh, they provide continuity, right? So again, when new people come on board or when old people leave, right? Uh, also, uh, if you don't have any, uh, SOPs or procedures make some. I see this a lot with startups and new teams, uh, and it's, you know, it's reasonable. You're a bunch of new people working together, new tasks. Uh, but start with the simple processes and, and tasks, right? And then work your way up to uh, documenting some of the uh, more complex uh, tasks that you have and processes. And make sure that you continually revisit them. I always view SOPs and process, you know, SOPs as documentation, uh, just like software has documentation, it's documentation for operations, right? So make sure that uh, you maintain that stuff. It's really important. Avoid this, <laughs> set it and forget it. We all fall into this trap, you know. Uh, I, I think there's a thing called the alert fatigue where we set up infrastructures, we monitor them, and we get alerts. Your disks are on this cluster are at 75%. And then we go, I'll check it at 85, right? And then it hits 85 and, oh crap, it's at 99, right? So like, you know, you, you really have to monitor this whole mentality within your teams. Um, it's, easy, it's easy to get uh, in trouble with that. So technology for me is about the people, right? And when you have people involved, they form cultures. And the cultures, set our values, our goals, and attitudes. Now I want to talk about <laughs> managers. I'm from New Jersey, by the way, so uh, I had to make a Jersey reference. Who here runs their teams like this guy? Come on, you know there's out there. I know that lady right there, yeah. <laughs> nah, just kidding, man. So um, yeah, just want to talk about managers and some of the behaviors that, uh, you know, yeah, point out some behaviors. So I run my teams when I'm in charge, uh, or when I'm put in charge. Uh, I, I call my management style pseudo management, right? So what I do is I try to work on my teams as an equal, right? 
So that knocks down all the intimidation barriers. Um, and then when I have to do man manager shit, right, I sudo up <laughs> into manager role and do what I have to do. Maybe HR uh, type things, maybe uh, budget, whatever it is, I do it. Then I, you know, ex uh, grace gracefully exit and start working as an equal again amongst my teams. Empower your, your teams, right? Uh, give them the ability to take ownership of things without having to ask for it. Uh, I think it's really important that we have environments where people just kind of can make decisions and not worry about having to ask for permission. Embrace your failures. These are obviously, right, as most people said here in, in previous talks, uh, these are teaching opportunities or learning moments. Um, don't try to hide the sun with your hand. Uh, and also, you know, it, it just, it, it's a good policy to have. Just embrace it, move on, right? Mentor your people, give them the ability to uh, to learn and teach each other. Uh, I, I believe that uh, it helps them, you know, continually better their uh, personal careers and also give, inspires them to, uh, you know, uh, also continue to learn, uh, keep, keep continuing their education, um, bettering uh, their skills. Make those hard choices. Don't sustain untenable situations. Uh, I see, I struggle with this sometimes, you know, when maybe a teammate's not performing as well and you realize that they just don't care. Uh, you know, get rid of them. <laughs> it's better for you, it's better for the team. Uh, don't let it linger because it, it'll just do damage, more damage than good. Now let's talk about us as individuals. We picked on the managers uh, enough. I had to make an office reference, right? So I, we all contribute to culture, and you know we, I don't have my notes, sorry. <laughs> we, we all contribute to culture, so I, I really want everyone here to understand that you, you can be a leader without having a title, right? Um, just drive some decisions within your teams if no one's really like, if everyone's kind of wishy-washy, which happens sometimes, just be that person. Stand up, start driving some of those decisions, take an interest. Uh, take ownership of some things that maybe people don't want to take ownership of. Something's broke, <laughs> just fix it. Don't be the person that points it out, right, and says, hey, we have some problem with this piece of code. Uh, it really annoys me when people have the ability to fix things and they just don't, like a piece of code. You go in, you, you know, do a git pull, branch it, fix it, push it, commit it, and then make a PR so that everyone can see what you're doing and then socialize right, what you've done, uh, instead of just pointing it out. It's just much faster and it helps people. And it's a good way to level up, right? Level up your skills uh, doing that stuff. Uh, mentees, <laughs> put the work in, right? You have mentors, yeah, we're there to help you and guide you, uh, but you have to do the work. You have to do the heavy lifting. Uh, I always tell my team, uh, you know, when, when they ask me for help, the first question is, did you do a little research? And in general, they're, they're, they, the ones that know me, they, they respond with a yes. Uh, and I advise people to do about a, a 15 to 20 minute research on things. And if you don't, you know, the concepts are not clear or you're not really finding the answers you need, then, then ping your mentor. Otherwise, you're gonna get a let me Google that for you from me. Yeah. So I struggle with this all the time. Uh, I believe that uh, we should take, the, take a moment, a breather. Uh, and I struggle with the slow talkers, all you slow talkers out there. It's really hard. I'm a fast-paced Jersey guy, right? So, uh, but at the end of the day, I need to always tell myself, all right, just let this person get their, express their feelings, express their ideas, and then I can respond, right? It's, it's, a, it's a good skill to, to improve on always. Communication, uh, I don't consider listening. Uh, they're related. It's related to communication, but uh, I don't consider it communication. Uh, what I'm talking about here is uh, learn how to uh, improve your interactions with people. Uh, learn how to write, uh, you know, uh, express yourself written form. Uh, also, um, it's a good way for you to improve your so social skills if you don't have any. Uh, level up, right? Like, go out there and communicate. Uh, and one other thing, I, I, I see this all the time throughout my career, uh, don't elicit emotion from written text, right? Like, I've seen a guy go crazy because uh, someone wrote something in a git commit statement, right? <laughs> he got really emotional about it and it wasn't even directed at him. 
And, you know, we're human. We, sometimes we're in bad moods and we read things and the intent is that we're, or the, yeah, the intent that we're reading is not really what's happening. So what I recommend is, you know, if you, if you feel like you're in that situation, go ahead, have coffee with that person. Uh, have a phone call because, uh, you know, Speaking to them about a situation that's a little bit maybe negative, uh, you'll realize, come to realize, like, oh, they totally didn't intend that. <laughs> it's happened to me a bunch of times. So in closing, technology problems are not really technology problems, right? I believe that uh, we as people, again, we, we form cultures, uh, and we have to help each other out, uh, especially on teams, right? We spend a lot of time together, working together, more time than we do spend with our families, right? Uh, I want you all to leave here with just the idea that you're inspired to go and make your teams better and build better cultures together. Thank you.